Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Welcome back to Deep in Bear Country, a Berenstain Bear cast. I am your host, Phil Gonzalez, and did you know that God is love? Did you know that? Well, according to the first epistle of John, uh, he is. God is love. Whoever does and whoever does not know God is just because they don't they don't have they're not in love. They don't know how to love. If you don't know how to love, you don't know God. If you were born of God, then you automatically love. And you know God. So love everyone. Because love comes from God. That's from the uh, the first, like I said, first epistle of John. And it's the opening quote of this week's Gifts of the Spirit book. Remember, we're doing all of the Berenstain Bears Gifts of the Spirit that have been published as of when I record. And this week's book is Berenstain Bears Gifts of the Spirit Love by Mike Berenstain. And that's a huge topic, love. So what exactly, what are we talking about when we talk about love? And what is the, what's the lens? I guess, through which we are approaching the subject of love. And I appreciate that Mike sets us up right off. He sets us up. The actual quote he uses is simply, God is love. He says, God is love, 1 John 4, 8, the first epistle of John 4, 8, and uh, the the entire 8 is all, is whoever does not love God, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. I can see why he didn't include that because that's not really rel. It is relevant to the, but that's implied. Like that's that's implied in the overall theme of John four, John chapter four, uh, and, and more or less the overarching theme of the first epistle of John. What is what is the first epistle of John? Uh, the first epistle of John is a, is called, you usually see it listed as 1 John. Uh, it's a letter written by an unknown author who identifies himself as the elder. Uh, and he's writing to a community of people who are already believers in Jesus Christ as Messiah. He's not writing to a bunch of, uh, you know, he's not, he's not writing to people who are on the fence. Uh, this is a community of Christians or, you know, future Christians. Uh, nobody really knows who the author of of John is. Uh, some people really hold that it's the same person who wrote the Gospel of John, but there's so many discrepancies in the style of the writing, and not just like the style of the writing, but the uh, basic sentence construction. Uh, the way they, the way that the writer uh, puts, where they put verbs it, as opposed to the now, like direct objects and the verbs, it's it's so different that many people are just, uh, as of the, the early 20th century, I believe, uh, scholars were like, you know what, I don't think this is actually the same author We don't even know who the author of John was. Like, John is just, that was who most people just chose to believe. But this is one of the, what is it, three, four letters from this writer to different members of the church and the early church, early Christian church. Uh, And this is a letter about uh, theological and ethical issues uh, that are facing this community that, that, that this writer is writing to. So it's, it's, it's not a long letter, but it's, it's structured around a series of themes uh, the, the the main one of which, or the one of the most important ones in this letter, is the concept of the importance of love, uh, and as well as as you see in letters of Paul, like you avoiding false prof, uh, false messiahs, the antichrists as they call them, uh, avoiding them, avoiding false teachings, and it covers you know just the general nature of Jesus. Uh, and but but one of the main points of the letter is that the author, and this is how it applies to today's book, this week's book, the author throughout the letter encourages the community that they're writing to, to love one another uh, and hold fast in their faith, but really emphasizes the love. Um, So what it does is it places a strong, I don't want to use the word emphasis again, but strong emphasis on love as uh like basically the the crux of the christian faith the the crux of christianity is love that it's not just a feeling that we have but an active uh an active commitment to the well-being of people in your community of other of others 
very similar to what we talked about in our last episode. Not our, not in our last episode. That was about sharing, uh, but in our episode about caring, the the gift of the spirit of caring. Very much along the same lines, where uh, caring isn't something passive. And love, in the as far as the author of the first letter of John is concerned, a true follower of Jesus Christ puts love into action. And what he does in this letter is he encourages he encourages the community to which he is writing uh, to demonstrate their love through their relationships with each other. Uh, uh, it's considered a pastoral letter because it seeks to encourage and instruct a community of believers in their faith while warning them against false teachings and the dangers of sin. Um, now, specifically, uh, Mike calls out John 4, 8, uh, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And this is part of a section of the book that's really emphasizing love and the importance of love. Um, and it's it's important to remember that the people that John was addressing were facing a lot of challenges at the time. And one thing that was happening was there was a lot of arguing in the church about the nature of Jesus, like not just his teachings, but who he was from a, on, a, on a fundamental level. And one of the big arguments and questions, this is pre-Gnosticism, but one of the things the Gnostics would do when they when they broke away from the main church was they took with them the idea that Jesus was pure spirit. He wasn't a human at all. There was nothing uh, physical about him. And many Christians uh, completely disagreed with that. And they claimed that, yes, while he was part spirit, he had to be human at some point. He had to be tangible in order for him to, to actually suffer. And in order for him to be able to honestly relate to human beings. Uh, love from an unknowable entity is different than love from a human being or love from someone who can feel as a human can feel. And in order for Jesus to feel as a human can feel, he had to have some humanity in him. So depending on, you know, which school of thought you belong to, Jesus was more or less a person at various points throughout the story. But that's central to the concept of love. And uh, the author of the book is making a huge claim about God in this chapter uh, because as opposed to a God who demands fealty, uh, obedience, strict following of rules that have been set out. He is saying, or they are saying, whoever the author of this book is, or this letter is saying, is that God is at its core uh, a being of love, is, is, is in essence uh, love, and that you have to be able, you have to be in touch with love, not just of yourself, but of your others, of your community, in order to just be on the same wavelength as this God that you are ostensibly worshiping, uh, and that, and that, that's if you're gonna if you're gonna be on this trail with us, if you're gonna follow this train, if you're gonna be riding this train and following this trail, you gotta give yourself over to love, a uh, deep abiding love. So it's not just rules, it's not just obligations, it's not just fealty and worship. It's love for for God, but also most importantly for your fellow humans. Uh, particularly, as we're going to get into in this book, uh, people who are outside of your sphere. Because if there's one thing this letter is not about, it's not about evangelizing. It's not about bringing people over to the faith. It's simply about, this part is simply about love. And what is love, if not the greatest, perhaps, gift of the Spirit? So what's happening in Bear Country? What is happening in our town? Uh, well, we got this family. Don't know if you've heard of them. It's a family of bears, and there's five of them. There's a mother, a father, a sister, and a brother, and a baby, or a toddler, or like a pre a pre kindergartner. I don't know how old she is right now. Their names are mama, papa, sister, brother. They appreciate each other, and they live in a split level tree. And they've got a little sister named Honey Bear. And you know what? The you know what? Above all else, you know what's a th a common thread through every single Berenstain Bears iteration, through every continuity, through every timeline. Through every geological or geographical, sorry, alteration in the fundamental baseline uh, canon of the Berenstain Bears, the one thing that holds true through all these is that these bears, this family of bear, they kind of love each other. They kind of love each other. They look after each other, as it says. They care for each other. They love one another. But they don't just love each other. They don't just love each other in the house. They also love their family, like Grizzly Gramps and Grizzly Graham. They go and visit them. They say, hey. Do you know who else they love? Huh? Maybe Lizzie Bruin and her family. There's Lizzie. There's Barry. There's the parents. But especially, okay, we got Cousin Fred, huh? Aunt Men. 
Uncle Ned, and a new baby in their family, Baby Teddy. Baby Teddy's back, everyone. Little Baby Teddy. They love them. They love their friends. They love their family members. And you know what? They love a lot of people in their community, even the people who maybe they don't get along with. The, the, say the two talls, for instance, the other grizzlies out there. Maybe there's some old animosity, but animosity is not the same as not loving. You cannot like someone and still love them. And I think that's one thing that Mike is trying to get across here, is that however much they might disagree or, you know, rub each other the wrong way, or I don't know, try to swindle each other out of insurance money or build wax museums. I can't some A lot of weird stuff happened in the chapter books. No matter how much that happens, there is still a, a, a base love at the heart of, of the bears for one another. But now there's something interesting introduced. There are bears in bear country who aren't part of their family or even their extended family. Because it makes a point to say your family isn't just those related to you. It's also the people you just love out and you just love. Your friends are your family. That's a huge, it's a huge statement. But what about the people out in the town that aren't part of your family? The ones whose names you don't even know. You see them maybe, but you don't know who they are. Do you love them? Do you love them too? What about those bears? And we see the bear family kind of scratching their heads and you see a bunch of bears we've never seen before. Although one of them looks a lot like Mayor Honeypot. Uh, and one of them looks a lot like one of their teachers. And one of them looks a lot like their babysitter. One of them is their babysitter because she's even holding her bag that has the tiddlywinks in it. That's their babysitter. They know her. Maybe they haven't been babysat by her in a long time. I don't know. But she's holding the tiddlywinks bag. And we also got one of those bears with a weird moustache. And I always love them. But do they love these bears? And how do you know? And why? And wherefore? Well, fortunately, there's a big potluck supper coming up. Now, if you don't live in the Midwest, you might not be a hand at potlucks. But let me tell you, they exist. They're a thing that happens. What better way to give yourself an excuse to buy chips at the last minute than a potluck? A potluck. Well, there's a big potluck coming up. It's me, your neighbor day. Come one, come all. Potluck supper gonna be in town square. In fact, the the notice is attached to old shag, the old scratching tree. That's right. Save that back scratcher. You might need to nail a meet your neighbor day potluck supper come one come all message up on it. Uh, there's no fence around it. And there's no bench. So again, different timeline. I also want to point out that town halls built in a like old Roman style or like classical greek style with your doric columns but the columns are made out of wood and the wood is has like like sawn off branches sticking out like the town hall itself looks like like white the white classical architecture from like the like washington dc when they were building all the monuments but they've left the the columns looking like raw wood and the stairs certainly not level uh with each other an architectural nightmare i guess is what i'm saying town hall is uh but Lo and behold, it is time for the potluck. And Mama and Papa, and it says Mama and Papa and the Cubs prepare their favorite dish. I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that maybe just Mama did it. Uh, honey baked salmon, fresh, fresh off the honey. I don't, I was, I don't know what I was going to say there. Fresh off the something. Uh, they grab their honey baked salmon, which when you, when you look at it, it's, it's just, I don't know how to put this delicately, but this just looks like a dead fish on a plate. Like it's even kind of smiling. It's still got its face. Doesn't look like it's been dressed or prepared in any way. It's just a dead fish. It's not even white. It's just, it's still got the color of its scales on it. Mama just took a dead fish, wrapped it in plastic, and is bringing it to a potluck. Well, in any case, uh, there's Lizzie Bruin and her family. Uh, there's Too Tall and Too Ton. I don't see Too Too, but I do see Too, what's the mama's name? Too Much? Too Tired? Too, too Loud? I don't remember what the mama's name is. But uh, the Grizzlies are there. A bunch of other bears are there. Everyone's there. What does this have to do with love? We see Farmer and Mrs. Ben. We see Preacher Brown, Mrs. Brown, and their, it just says, their grown-up daughter and son. And I'm like, I don't know why they didn't give them names. I don't know why Mike was like, we're not going to, we don't need to name the grown-up. I want to know Preacher Brown and Mrs. Brown's grown-up daughter and son's name. Uh, it's funny how he's drawn them. He's drawn... You can tell that Mike put some thought into this. Like, how do I draw someone? How do I draw two bears who are supposed to read as like, I guess, roughly the age of Gloria and Michael in the first season of All in the Family? Like, I assume that that's kind of the age they're supposed to, like, just out of college, like young 20-somethings. Like, he's like, I've got to draw bears who don't just look like every other bear because these bears are supposed to be from a different generation 
but not they're not cubs. Uh, and you can see he put effort into it because they look a little different. Their hair, the looks on their faces, their clothes. It's funny. Uh, I wish they had names. Alberta and Miguel is how I'm naming them. Uh, welcome, Alberta. Welcome, Miguel. They've brought some food. Everyone's here. Blessed day. But wait a minute. There's strangers in their midst. There's strangers here. Bears they've never even seen before. Uh, they see uh, new folks that talk and dress differently. The food they had brought was different too. And I'm gonna, okay, Mike has done, so, well, let's, let's read on because I, I want to get to who these bears are first. Uh, Mama and Papa explained to the cubs, these are new neighbors who've just moved to bear country. They used to live far away, but they needed to find new homes. They traveled here from all around the world. So what we're looking at, they needed to find new homes. I am assuming, the word is never used, but I am assuming that these bears in their midst are meant to represent refugees of some sort. These are bears who have left their homes because it was most likely not safe to be there anymore and, are, and have settled in bear country have settled for bear country, have, 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 have been uh, moved to bear country through some kind of government program. Uh, this is a situation that I'm very familiar with because I live in Minneapolis, which has uh, huge refugee populations. Um, we, have, we have a large Hmong population. We have a large Somali population. We have a lot of, a lot of refugees who've come from different parts of the globe, uh, settled in, uh, and we have witnessed firsthand the difficulties that can arise when you are attempting to help new neighbors integrate into a neighborhood, into a into a community uh, in which they are not familiar with the way things, the things that most of the people in the community take for granted, I guess. Uh, there can be some culture shock there and there can be some conflict be th around that as communications might be difficult, as just cultural norms are so different. Uh, but it's important to welcome them in, however difficult it might be. Because if it's difficult for you, imagine how difficult it is for the people who are arriving from another country and another culture and another who knows what. Uh, we don't really address that here it doesn't get that because it's, we're almost done with the book. And we've just introduced a whole bunch of refugees. Where are these refugees from? Uh, they're from, it looks like, um, I don't know, Philip Pullman's His Dark Material series. Like one of them is dressed like a Cossack. I don't understand. So one thing about this is to signify that these are not bears from bear country. They, they are dressed... They are each dressed in a different variation on uh, an outfit from somewhere else in the world. I don't actually know where they're supposed to be from. Uh, one guy has like a a, a, a a weird, a wild, long, like Salvador Dali-esque mustache. He's wearing a, a ploofy hat. He's got like a, a purple tunic on and loose blue pants. I don't know where he's supposed to be from. There's uh, one couple, the woman has like a blue shawl and a yellow cap, like a peaked cap on her head. She has earrings in her ears, and her husband is wearing brown pants and some kind of, like, earthy-colored, like, flowy poet shirt. There's a couple, the woman is wearing a, like, a, not the same kind of, like, a shawl, a long, draped shawl around her shoulder. She has solid earrings, a headband, and a green dress, and she has a husband, I presume, who's wearing just, like, a, a yellow shirt and jeans, and they have a couple of kids. The girl is wearing some kind of dress. Uh, there's another couple who are both wearing matching. Out all They're all wearing matching outfits, like the straight down the front shirt or tunic or something that closes in front, but no collar. And they both have they all have headbands on except for the older girl. Uh, and then uh, finally, there's a woman and her daughter who have like head scarves, but not like not like uh, like not like religious head scarves, but like babushka head scarves. And she's wearing an apron and a skirt and the daughter is wearing a skirt and a like a babushka head scarf. And the father is wearing uh, another like sort of tunicky thing with a belt and red pants and holding a baby who's all swat. I have no idea where these people are from. They look to be from like made up, made up country, like made up Landia. I don't know where it's from. Who knows? They don't call it out. Maybe in a future book, they get a little more fleshed out. I guess because it's not really important. That's not what the book is about, where they're from. The idea is that they are not from here. Now, I'm going to put on my little soapbox 
for a second. If you're not specifying where the bears are from, they didn't necessarily have to be dressed up like Epcot employees. Like these don't, they didn't have to look, they didn't have to look like they just stepped off, like they just wandered onto Ellis Island. Like they didn't, they've uh, clearly been through some kind of process. Uh, uh, I mean, I mean, it's not like they can't wear, I don't even know how to say it, like cultural garb. I don't know what the proper term for this is, uh, but they they could also just be wearing T-shirts and jeans like they don't they could. They, they, I don't know. It's funny. It's interesting. Uh, it reminds me of that whole like the, the whole like traditional garb. Like what's the traditional garb of your culture? And the response is always is what I'm wearing, like what I'm wearing, like. Typically, people dress like me. Like, they, they wear a concert shirt and jeans. Uh, what do Mexicans dress like? I might be asked. Oh, they dress like me, apparently. They dress like me or my dad or, like, my grandmother did. Like, a person? Like, just a, just hanging out, I guess? Uh, oh, no, no, no. We mean in, in Mexico. Kind of just like me. Like, if you go to Mexico, you're just going to see people dressed like just people. Oh, well, you know, traditionally, what do they dress? Oh, you mean, like, like 150 years ago? Like, I guess that was traditional. That, what does traditional mean? Like, how far back is... Because not my traditions. And I think that's what we got here. We got some traditional garb. I mean, you could dress like a Cossack if you want, I guess. But this guy, I mean, he looks like he's ready to... He's, he's like, at the bar in Anna Tevka, and he's ready to, like, begrudgingly make friends with Tevya and Laser Wolf. Like, he's... He's full on. Again, I don't know what country he's supposed to be from. Uh, but these new bears introduce them, or the cubs introduce themselves to their new neighbors and sample their new interesting food. Now, it's weird. I don't know what it is either. It looks like pinwheel party pleasers, like a little ham roll. Could be anything. Uh, could be mushroom stumps. I don't know what these are. They're cylinders with little spirals in the middle. Some kind of roll up. Uh, I mean, it could also be supposed to be like baklava or something. I have no idea. In any case, the kids love it. Uh, and before you know it, all the cubs of different backgrounds and cultures are rolling around on the ground with each other. Uh, even though some look like they're dressed from biblical times, uh, you know, they, they all get along. Who knows? Uh, some of them are wearing vests. I guess some maybe newsies, or uh, maybe they are the escaped Romanov family. I have no idea. Uh, but everyone's thrilled to see the kids rolling around and playing. Next thing you know, they're all sitting around eating. Papa's trying what looks to be some kind of a chimichanga. There's some sort of scalloped dumplings, which look absolutely delicious. Some pot sticker kind of thing. We got some kind of cookies. It's really hard to tell. The, the, this is not the best drawn Berenstain food in the world. But I want to I call attention to something that's happening. It says the Cubs' parents got involved too, or together too. They talked and ate and drank and learned about each other. It was fascinating to find out how folks lived all around the world. But if you look at Preacher Brown, he's talking to a woman in a headscarf, and he's holding a plate, and he's got his finger up to his face, and that like, ah, very interesting, like, look. His arms are kind of crossed, and the, the, the hand that's not on his temple is holding the plate off to the side, and it had five of those scalloped pastries on it. But he's tilting it, and three of them are falling to the ground, and the other two are going to slide off onto the ground as well. Now, I'm assuming that what it's meant to be implying is that he's so engrossed in what she's saying, he doesn't even realize he's dropping all this delicious food. What it looks like to me is he's secretly trying to dump this food he doesn't want to eat onto the ground. It looks very disrespectful in the context of this book, which is we're just meeting and now I'm dumping this food you made on the ground. I'm the preacher. I don't accept your presence. It's kind of what it looks like. I know it's not supposed to be that. It's just a weird thing to include, especially because it's Preacher Brown who's doing it, a bear that we're kind of iffy on anyway. Uh, in any case, the bear family is time to leave. Everyone bids them farewell, which is really weird because, like, if you're at, like, a, a, a neighborhood gathering and you leave before everyone else does, like, people don't all stop what they're doing and wave goodbye. Like, they're just like, I oh, see it. Like, it doesn't... We're going to see you again. I don't know. It's weird. They're with, bo everyone at the party is wishing the Bear family bon voyage. The cubs have their tongues sticking out of their mouths. And look, downright sinister, okay? They've got Stanley Kubrick brows going on at the, at the reader. Their tongues are stuck out. They look like, they look malevolent. Uh, and it says, uh, I guess all bears are pretty much alike under the fur, said Papa as they headed home. And the family agrees. I mean, because they're full of food. And that's what it says. Like, they're full of food. We, what we've got here is another Berenstain Bears book that's like, we can all learn to get along as long as we like each other's cooking, right? I mean, right? That might be a little unfair. I, I don't mean to, to, to make total fun. But it does kind of seem like that at times. Like, I don't know. Uh, this is a Berenstain Bears Gifts of the Spirit book. It's about love. 
And, you know, Mike's, Mike is Christian, and so these books are inherently and always going to be Christian books. Um, but having refugees arrive, particularly refugees who seem to be from different cultural backgrounds, and I'm going to assume the headscarves are some sort of, like, implicate sort of visual shorthand for maybe religious backgrounds as well actually position these books very well to emphasize a message again as they did with caring and as they did with sharing beyond where we tended to go with the old living light series um so again john is about this you know uh talking about following the teachings of jesus not just in what he says but in what he does Sharing is love. Um, what Mike, I believe, is illustrating here is that the value of love, as talked about in the first epistle of John, love, you know, find love. That's what God is. You And, and as we saw in caring, a caring is not passive. Caring is an action. Love is an action. Love isn't something you need to feel. It is something you need to do. So when these refugees arrive, the bears, who are, as we have seen, a predominantly Christian community, are able to demonstrate their love, like the love not just that they have for each other, but the love that they choose to enact by welcoming the newcomers to their town and sharing their resources. Not just sharing their food, sharing their time, but sharing the resources they have. Now, in the book, it's shown by the food they share and the time. It, it, it says... Mama, Papa, and the Cubs prepared their favorite dish. They're not just sharing their food. They're sharing their time, which is one of their greatest resources. We've had books about time. We've had books about being on time. We've had religious books about being on time. The concept of time in bear country is important to them, not just practically, but spiritually. Uh, spending time doing something. Papa building a chair. Mama making a quilt. Uh, actual factual, walking with the cubs through the countryside, teaching them about science. These are all values sharing. You're sharing your time, your expertise, your resources, your hospitality. Um, so what could be happening here, the way I love to see it, I love to see it happen. Mike, knowing that his readers are primarily Christian, is saying, John the First is all about love. If you don't know love, you don't know God. Christian values are important, but the most important ones are compassion, hospitality, love, sharing, caring. And here is how you put those those values into action when meeting strangers. I mean, that's one of the central tenets of the Bible as well, right? Like going back to like the original books of the Bible, it is be hospitable. Like the notion of that goes beyond Christianity, beyond Judaism, beyond Islam. The, the notion of hospitality as probably the most important value is ancient as days. Um, there's a reason that, like, was it Zeus was like the god of hosts as, as one of his monikers was god of hosts? Because the host is the most important person in the community and anyone can be a host. You're only a host while you're hosting. And the reason for that is because human beings' survival depended on hospitality. It wasn't just being nice to a person in your house. You let a stranger in because otherwise that stranger would be on the street. And if someone's traveling and needs a place to stay, you let them in. And then there is a there is a uh, agreement, uh, a, uh, a societal contract between those two. And that contract says, I will not harm you while you are under the care of my roof. And you will not harm me while I am caring for you. And you see this played out in a lot of religious writings and in a lot of religious literature, including like Les Miserables, is literally about a man who betrays the compact between host and hosted uh, and how the host doesn't break that compact and uh, adheres to the, 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 the agreement he made when he allowed a, a man into his home, which is I will take care of you. No matter what, even a, even as it works against my own self-interest, I will still treat you like a, a human being and care for you. And that, of course, kicks off the entire story of Les Mis. This story isn't Les Mis, but it is. it emphasizes the importance of, dis regardless of another person's cultural or religious difference, no matter if they do not believe in the same God as you, in the same Messiah as you, in the same religious books as you, or if they don't even believe in religion. The important thing is that you treat them with compassion, with hospitality, with love, because you have a faith in which love is central, is a central tenet. In fact, if you don't have it, you don't have your faith. You're nowhere near your faith. The, the bears of different faiths are closer to your faith than you are 
Because if you don't have love and you don't walk in love and act in love and exercise love, you're not living up to the to the conditions of your faith. You're not doing what John said, which is be like Jesus by loving people like that by by loving people. But loving people isn't just sitting at home wondering and thinking about how in love you are with everyone. It's getting out in your community and doing something. It's inviting people to potlucks. It's it's showing up at potlucks with food and welcoming people with open arms. It's getting to know them, asking about asking them about themselves, having your kids play with each other, enjoying the fact that your kids are playing with each other, eating each other's food and appreciating what they have to offer. It's a give and take. And that's part of being a family. It's part of being a community. It's part of being welcoming. And the gifts of the spirit books are all about promoting gifts of the spirit, accepting people for who they are, loving people for who they are, and as we saw in Caring, giving people the space to be who they are free of judgment. And only, as we see in the Berenstain Bears books, stepping in to correct people when they've done something in violation of that trust and in violation of that cultural contract. Uh, we see that happen most often with Raffish Ralph in the chapter books, but it happens with the Cubs. It happens with anyone who's a bit naughty. They have to be taught a lesson. Strict lesson. Uh, yeah. So it's important to be mindful of cultural and religious differences, to avoid imposing your own beliefs and values on others. We saw that in the Ferdy Factual book. And and again, as I said up top, there is nothing in John the First about converting or proselytizing others. None of that's in there. Uh, and what we see from the bears, we don't get any actual dialogue between the bears, the new bears, or your old bear. But we do show people building friendships and building understanding through love and hospitality, through showing interest in other people's beliefs and traditions, for listening, but not, you know, listening in order to contradict, listening openly and not judging or making any kind of assumptions about these people. This is a new, these are not the bears from the Berens, the Berenstain Bears and the, you know, the Friendly Skunk or the Busy Beavers. These are new bears. Like, these are bears who are like, these people look different. They dress different. Their food is different. Time to learn about them. Time to not judge them, to not assume anything about them. Time to go in with an open mind, talk to them, get to know who they are as people. Because as Papa said, we're all the same under the fur. Um, and they find common ground. Now, in Bear Town, usually that common ground is food. We all love to eat. And I mean, many people will tell you, you want to get to know somebody, sit down and have a meal with them. Eat the things they love to eat. Learn what they like to learn. I mean, heck, learn to cook with them. Have, you know, cook together. That's a great way to learn about other people. But you got to love people. You got to be hospitable. You got to let them be themselves. Give them room to be themselves. Uh, and it says here that the teachings of the first epistle of John can be a helpful guide for building relationships with people of other faiths or beliefs. And by approaching these encounters with a spirit of, say it with me, love, as well as hospitality and respect. Believers can create opportunities for dialogue, learning, and growth, even in situations where there are significant differences in beliefs and values. And that is something that Mike has said to me personally on many occasions. At the end of the day, all he wants these books to do, all of his Berenstain Bears books, is help people learn how to approach the members of their community and the people they interact with in life with respect, with love, no matter who they are, period. These aren't books that are trying to turn you into Christians. These are books who are trying to teach you how to welcome people into your family. And your family is the family of humanity. The family of humanity, sometimes they are bears. That's all I'm saying. And that's it. That is the Berenstain Bears. Gifts of the Spirit, love, hopeless love, love unrequited, robs me of my rest. It's Gilbert and Sullivan. I can't remember what play it's from. One of their plays. Love. Anyway, that's it. That's the very Spirit's Gifts of the Spirit. Love will be back next week with another Gift of the Spirit. Can't wait to see what it is. I love these books. Uh, I like how hard they are. Huh? Gifts of the Spirit. So thank you all so much for listening. Thank you for joining me. Uh, check out my other podcast, Pizza Toast, and uh, It's Del Toro Time. We got some new stuff up with those. Check out my YouTube page, Phil Gonzalez. Uh, just search Phil Gonzalez Deep in Bear Country. You'll find it. I got some clips from all my shows up there. Uh, I've reworked some logos. So if you notice, the bear, maybe on your podcatcher, whatever you listen to this on, the Berenstain Bearcast logo might be looking a little different now, huh? I'm trying to, uh, to make my, all my branding the same so everything looks like it came from the mind of phil so uh i got some new logos i got new episodes of other shows to listen to check them out and uh i'll be back with more gifts of the spirit 
Keep on keeping on. Check me out on Twitter at Beast Dave Bearcast. Check me out on Facebook at Deep in Bear Country. And I will see all of you next time. I already said Deep in Bear Country, but I'm going to say it again. Deep in Bear Country.